comic book adaptations in general, just the ones that have already been done, the ones that we kind of can see coming a little bit, from a comic aficionado such as yourself, Mm -hmm. what are some of the ones that are particularly successful in how they were translated? How about some that weren't so successful (laughs) in Dark Phoenix? (laughs) Maybe we should uh, just start with Dark Phoenix and uh, talk a little little about that because... Um, I didn't think uh, Dark Phoenix was actually going to get released. Um, I well, was... Well, uh, it, it hasn't actually come out yet. They just bumped the trailer out, uh, what, last Monday? Uh, yeah, so, something like that. Right. Something like that. But uh, So, but nonetheless, with, um, you know, the, the, the fall of the Marvel Netflix shows, um, you know, Dark Phoenix has uh, obviously in complete and uh if not just in minor post-production and then you know yeah, on they, the keep, same... they keep going back for reshoots okay that, like there, there's there's been more than one reshoot which right kind of strange and then i'm gonna parlay this into to something else um as far as dark phoenix goes it's a weird balance of looking at what comic book creators have done over you know 50 you know almost now uh, 60 years with with the X-Men. So in order to set these stories up, pay homage to the characters and the creators and give us something that you have to compress into the two, two and a half hour format, it uh, seems very roll of the dice. Um, now we, we've seen it be very effective. Uh, I, I, we could talk about the Nolan films and how much um, the writing of that played into uh, Frank Miller's depictions in... Uh, especially Batman Year One, when we look at, at Batman Begins. Batman Begins for yeah. sure. And and to look at at the artist's work when you when you talk about um, uh, a guy like David Mazzucchelli. Um David Mazzucchelli was the illustrator on uh, the pencil and inker on Batman Year One, and uh, his ability to find drama in depictions uh, was was very cinematic. And uh, I mean, you can almost flip through that book and pull scenes uh, directly from the movie, as if he storyboarded it. Or vice versa, you know. Um, well, that, I, that sort of visual filmmaking just works, right? Um, like, like the like the MCU does it a lot, you know. Like in Civil War, like the the just that famous shot, right? You know, Tony and Steve. Just, mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, Sam Raimi was able to to pull some of that too, where uh, oh, for sure, you know, dropping like on the 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 suit and the trash can. Yeah, the the coattails of Todd McFarlane and having this this. You know, uh, surprisingly gymnastic and flexible Spider-Man to you know spin around the screen and things like that. And then, um, yeah, the, the garbage can scene, obviously, uh, you know, taken from uh, uh, that aspect. And then, even the early Steve Ditko work, um, who was the original penciler on uh, Spider-Man. There's a epic moment where Spider-Man has to to raise this you know giant concrete broken building off of his back and, right. and, and they, they do that in homecoming mm-hmm. yeah and that those those moments of of key feeling whether you were you know a 12 year old reader or a, or a 20 year old reader or whatever when you you legitimately feared for the character again because you didn't know what was going to happen to, to spider-man you know you didn't know that the, you know Gwen stacy was going to crack her head open and there was these and and that's, internal feelings and, and humanity and to, to it. Uh, on that note just Gwen Stacy that's um that that's another example of of a movie taking uh taking an event from the comics and trying to have it play out in their movie but it doesn't work and that's amazing spider-man too correct yeah yeah so so what do you what do you think about those amazing spider-man movies even maybe a little bit of spider-man 3 Spider-Man Three was was the result of a lot of like studio meddling. Uh, uh, I do know that. Whereas the first two, they just kind of let Sam Raimi make the movie that he made. Right. It, when we talk about Spider-Man Three, it's really, you know, we, we laugh and joke about how bad Joel Schumacher ruined that Batman franchise. Um, it's like, yeah, you think but, Batman Forever is bad? Well, I'll do you one better. Here's Spider-Man Three, and it's even shittier. You know, I mean, yeah, it, it, and then really, really confusing and really lost. Uh, target with with what you know made these films both interesting to fans and interesting to the general know, movie the goers. general movie public because that's you know? that's ultimate, ultimately what it comes down to right. it's like of course you're going to get an awful lot of us diehards but right the but, average shows not that and you want them in the theater too yeah yeah now the one that i'm excited about that i i, I need to hear more about is uh the hollywood take on the new mutants now if you've seen a little bit of this trailer or, or anything like that 
they have created a mutant horror story here. And oh yeah, we've talked about it on the show. Oh, I, I, um, it's a it's a clusterfuck uh, that's going on behind those scenes. See, they they made a complete movie. They cut the movie. I don't know if it was a final cut or what stage it was in, but the mm-hmm. studio came back to them and said, "Hey, here's the thing: superhero genre genre pieces are working, so make it a horror movie." Right. So they they went back for reshoots. These reshoots involved adding a complete new character that wasn't in the first shoot. Like at all, they mm-hmm. completely wrote in a character and had to shoot scenes around it and to right. insert and into this movie that was already made. Um, then I think they went back for more reshoots after that. Both Dark Phoenix and New Mutants have underwent a litany of behind the scenes issues in production. Yeah, that's and that's that's unfortunate. It looks like you know these movies are going to get gutted and and re put together and uh, again, like Justice League happened to Justice exactly, League. Exactly. Thank but, you. But I, I don't know how how good Justice League would have been. Zack Snyder's uh, original cut. I mean, you know, like it probably would have been better than what we got, but I don't know. We'll never see it. So. No, no. And and we might never see New Mutants. I, I don't know. Yeah, we might not see New Mutants. Like, like I'm, I'm still on the fence as to whether or not I believe Dark Phoenix whenever it says what its release date is. I think it's like in, in May now or something like that. Um, like, like, we'll see when we get to May if they feel like actually dropping it. But... New Mutants, they haven't said anything about that in, God, I don't know how long. And and just to reiterate my, myself, I know I've said it before, that movie was supposed to come out this previous March. Yeah, and, and I wonder if it'll fall into the category of um, this kind of uh, lost Ark of the Covenant to a degree where, you know, when when I first started going to conventions and, and uh, paying attention more, where the um, Fantastic Four movie that was shot in... Yep. Uh, you know, 89 ish, yep. I think. Um, That's one of those, those holy grails. Right. Holy like, grails of badness. Yeah. And you could, you know, you'd find some pirated copy on, on VHS or, or, you know, that kind of thing. Who knows that, that this New Mutants one might end up, you know, on this like downloadable internet content from, I don't know, some black site or, or whatnot. Yeah. You know? I mean, like, I'd be willing to sit through that one just because it seems like it is going to be Fantastic Four level bad like josh drank fantastic four because that was a that was a garbage fire i went oh, yeah. i went and saw that just because i needed to see what that what that train wreck looked like mm-hmm. and it, it looked exactly like a train wreck but uh, um as far as dark phoenix goes because for one thing it doesn't really seem like new mutants um i haven't really read a whole lot of new mutants mm-hmm. but it's not like a horror story that's not what it is so it seems like they're botching that adaptation again i don't know if hollywood has to go you know, directly from the source. I'm okay with that. I'm, oh, yeah, I'm, sure. You can deviate. Right. And you have to deviate in order to make it sellable to the, the general but, public. But it's, it's in terms of, like, do the deviations work? Does the adaptation work? Do you right. get enough of the story across that it's not pandering to, to the nerd fans? Right. But, like, it's also telling a convicting story. Like, mm-hmm. like the Captain America Civil War is one of my favorite entries of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but they're adapting, like... A series of like a, a big Marvel event in the comics and I mean like right. like there's the main Civil War comics that you can read and then all the characters involved have their own like singular like comics mm-hmm. that tell more to the Civil War story that's a whole lot of stuff to condense and to say we're just gonna tell a two and a half hour version of it and these are the people that we're gonna use right but they pulled it off oh yeah and I think that's uh, I mean maybe genius is too far but this is oh, the no the Rus- the Russos are, are Probably some of the most talented filmmakers that are that are working right now. Right, and then that you know caters to the intelligence of of what the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe has done is they've taken the properties that they've had that no one cared about um, from a, especially from a fandom level. No, like Iron Man, exactly. Made Tony uh, Stark a household name. Yeah, old shellhead. Nobody, nobody. You know, you you might. Be able to, you know, get 10 people on the street and get two of them to pick out which one's Iron Man out of the list. Marvel you know? got people to be upset about a plot point involving the Mandarin. Yes. Yes. And and uh, did a, a fantastic job on it. And uh, so that's something that, that Marvel has always been very, very good at is, is making two-dimensional characters or low-interest characters. They've had, they've had villain problems, but... Yeah, but the villains don't... They can't all be Killmonger and the Vulture. Right. Loki. Right. Thanos. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll have another uh, cast about uh, movies that people think are pretty good that I don't think are good. Oh, you so, weren't you weren't into Infinity War? No, I just wasn't that into Black Panther, to be honest with you. No, I mean, so. like, I, like I liked I liked Black Panther, but mm-hmm. yeah, but I mean, I can see where you're coming from. Right. Um, 
but but like in terms of so that's that's the deal with new mutants in terms of dark phoenix they've had a crack at this storyline before and i've literally only seen x3 the one time and that was enough i went and saw it in theaters and walked out of it like well that was shit and i never watched it again yeah um you know x x3 brought a little bit of the uh dark phoenix saga to life what i'm worried about is dark phoenix is more of a a selling point than it is the actual storyline yeah um it's like we're just going to put that brand on it like don't right. you want to see the dark phoenix it's right. that big thing that happens in the x-men comics right and 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 you know that's the nail on the head right there sam is is why even call it dark phoenix when it doesn't seem like dark phoenix it seems like you know Gene's having mental problems. Right. And and that's definitely what it was in X3. Right. Like, because they just kind of shoehorn it in at the end. Sure. Um, and now they're now they're making just the full-fledged, we're not going to be shy about it, we're going to call this movie Dark Phoenix. Right. But I remember, I, I really enjoyed uh, Days of Future Past. I yes. thought that was Excellent one of those, film. oh yeah, it's one of those movies where it, like, it takes elements of the story and it mm-hmm. takes enough of it that you can recognize a lot of yeah. it. And it tells it in a very efficient way. Yeah, I think it's a little over two hours, mm-hmm. and like the in terms of pacing, like right. it never slows down. It's always moving forward, and like, but it's not confusing. Right, like you're able to follow all the stuff that happens. It's not convoluted. Yeah, it's, Future Past is uh, you know is in the, you know the top ten of of X Men stories. Oh, and, top five, uh, I'd say. Yeah, and and you know, so is is the Dark Phoenix Saga. You know, yeah, Dark and, Phoenix Saga might be their biggest story. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you you work into a, a a couple other things um but for the most part you know the extinction agenda um is another one that that comes up that was a a, a big you know x-men crossover between everything like that and maybe those will be more explored now that we have you know options of these uh different uh studios being able to cross over to each other i mean yeah soon enough, soon enough disney's gonna own it all so right as far as adaptations go i think it should be noted about uh what we're looking at with uh, the Punisher, the who, Netflix series. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, we will mention that, but we're looking at our fourth incarnation of the Punisher. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the original was uh, the Dolph Lundgren. Mm-hmm. Uh, then after that was the Thomas Jane, which, in you know, all regards to Barenthal for a two-hour film, the Thomas Jane one, I, I think, is is fantastic, and and uh, you know, keeps getting better every time I watch it. Are you referring to the one with uh, John Travolta as the bad guy? Yes, that's oh, the one. Man. No, it, I'm, I'm telling you, you keep watching that movie again and again, and it's better and better every time. If you say so. I hear I hear Warzone's really good. Um, I, I have never sat down to watch that one, but I hear people people laud that as like that's the that's the it doesn't get the credit that it deserves in yeah. terms of the Punisher portrayal. There's I think there's problems in casting. Um, they you know if you watch the the TV show Rome on HBO, uh, they they pulled the guy that plays Titus Pullo to uh, and he also plays Firefly in the GI Joe series. Um, in order to be the Punisher, and I, I just don't buy him as Frank Castle. Um, mm-hmm. And which, coincidentally, if you know, you showed me a, a, a picture, I wouldn't pick Thomas Jane. But he does what he's supposed to do in in uh, in the uh, again John Travolta bad guy one. The John know? Travolta bad guy one. Um, but it, it, the thing I, I like about that one is it has a comic book flair to it. There's there is. The, it is shot in certain moments. The characters are a little glitchy and over the top, almost, uh, you know, a Punisher version of Dick Tracy where, the, you know, the, mm-hmm. yeah, the Rebecca Romaine uh, character living in this apartment building and Thomas Jane moving in and there's a popsicle scene that is uh, it's, it's gonna It's always going to be her role in, uh, her role in X-Men, <laughs> X-Men that did it for me. That was it. Yeah, yeah. But so so that's, one of those, that's, so that's one of those movies that, that at least you feel that... Um, that the kind of over the top comic book quality holds up. Mm-hmm. Uh, conversely, around the same time, that's whenever those original Fox Fantastic Four movies were coming out. Right. Not the one that was shot in like eighty nine, no, ninety, no, no, no. and then never yeah. came out. But, yeah, but we're talking like Captain America is uh, Chris the, Evans, the fire guy. Yeah, Chris Evans is Human Torch. Yeah, uh, yeah, and then the uh, the guy uh, Jessica, from what? Jessica Alba was still relevant at the time. Right. So was the guy that played the commish that uh, was the thing. I didn't. I didn't have too many issues with the uh, with the first Fantastic Four. Um, the Silver Surfer got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah, and, and it, it seemed like they ran out of money, if if you want to call it that, because they didn't give us Galactus. Yeah, that's he's, he's what, like a big cloud, right? Something like that, and that's one of those where it's like I get that you're that you have to make a change. Like if you can't portray this, right? Like you have to do something. But like, I don't know how the creative process wouldn't have just been. Well, I guess we'll go with a different bad guy. 
Yeah, you know, and then on the on the flip side, if you want to, you know, look at Fox versus versus Marvel, here Marvel is de- dealing with Doctor Strange and working through it creatively in order to give us what magic looks like and you know what a celestial being looks like and how that works With and so dormammu exactly you that was, know that was a fun scene it, absolutely Dorm, Dor, dormammu benedict cumberbatch by the way also plays dormammu oh if you man. didn't know i did not know that i yeah, did so that. i know it's just him arguing with himself i know he does a great job as as smog apparently in uh one of the Peter Jackson. Uh, yep, yep. He's the he's the dragon. Right. He actually got in a green scene, green screen suit, and crawled around the floor, acting like a dragon for that movie. Yeah. Um, but anyways. So, but yeah, how you handle things like that, and and how you present it to us, um, is is very very important. And and when you do make an adaptation and do make changes, um, it it still needs to be sellable. Right. Um, it has to work in the end. Right. Green Lantern. Uh, oh yeah. It's it's unsellable in ninety percent of the movie, and then you have Deadpool, um, one of those where it's it's like it also tells an origin story, but right? Like you buy into the origin story; it's a fun story to go along with. Okay, and and with comic book Kane and, and everything like that, Deadpool has evolved so much since oh, his, from the first series. Well, from his, his initial introduction in, in New Mutants ninety eight, because he, he wasn't written as he is now. Of, of breaking the no, the, he he eventually got to that point. Right, yeah. right. So that is again having an intelligent creative staff or creative writers that are they're putting these movies together that says let's take the meat and potatoes, let's take the the core and the essence of what this character is, and rift on that in order to to make a good story. That again has happened in you know the Nolan Batman films. That has happened. Uh, we'll we'll take the eighty nine Batman to look at what the core of this character is and then, you know, let whoever the director is or, or, you know, the production designers, let Tim Burton tell his version of the story. Oh yeah. So maybe, especially Batman returns. That is a Tim Burton movie that happens to have (laughs) Batman in it. That is, that is what that is. But let's see, are are there any other big ones that we, that we need to touch on before we wrap this up? I don't know if there's any necessarily large ones, but I think it's important to remember that there's a lot of small ones. When you're looking at, uh, you know, obviously League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is is a uh, comic book movie. Uh, v for Vendetta is a comic book movie. Oh, and I was going to say, there's a handful of those out there that they are based on on a comic IP. Right. And But you wouldn't know it because it's not a DC or a Marvel or... Exactly. Really, and that's it as far as, I mean, they're the, they're the big ones. They're the big guys. Right. Uh, you know, a movie like 300 or, or Sin City, uh, you know, I don't know if, if people necessarily understand that that these properties are coming from mm-hmm. comic books. And uh, I and would both hope... Both of those are Frank Miller properties, I believe. Yeah, they, yeah, they both are. Uh, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Frank Miller can make a good movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we know that from the spirit. Thank you. A deep cut there. Right. And I believe he also... This is the, this is the interesting part is uh, he wrote RoboCop two, oh um, man. which is is horrendous. Yeah, there's one good RoboCop movie. There's, yeah, there's just one good one. And he's he's come out in interviews and said uh, that's why he left Hollywood until uh, for some you know happenstance him and Robert Rodriguez were able to get together and and uh, and do Sin City. Well, that's um, a that's a actually neat little story. Robert Rodriguez shot you know that that uh, that sequence with the red dress and uh, yeah. Not Colin Farrell, that other guy, Josh Hartnett. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, that, se- the movie. That, that sequence. He shot that without Frank Miller's permission. Sent him the the, the reel for it uh-huh. and said, "Watch this. Let me know if if I can make the rest of it. If you hate it, then I'll destroy it. it right. Never see the light of day. But just watch it and let me make the rest of it, please." Right. And, and he watched that and he said, "I'll help you make it if I can if I can work on it with you." And that's how it happened. And crazy successful. Oh yeah, well the first one's great. The second one I was not as into. Like the like the one story that was already like written that mm-hmm. was actually taken from a graphic novel, that was a good story. Right. Yeah, the other two were originals for the movie and I yeah. didn't like either one of them. Yeah. Yeah, and I, again, I think that whenever you're dealing with these comic book adaptations is is that it's important to go to the, back to the source and see why these characters are doing this and why Hollywood has has chosen these particular stories. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. No, yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually really glad that we got into some of those more obscure ones before we got to the end of this. But I think we got a lot of really good talk out of that. We got a lot of a lot of new information out there. Definitely a lot of stuff that I wasn't aware of. I don't know. I just I, I had a great time talking. Uh, thank you so much for coming by. Absolutely. I'd love to be back.
once again, this is uh, this is local local artist and comic aficionado Dave Bain. And my name is Sam. We are brought to you by Movie Night Autopsy, and you've been listening to The Minute. Thank you so much for listening, and if you have anything that you want to add to the conversation, be sure to do so if you're leaving a comment below or you're hitting us up across the webs. Just make sure that you reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, this is The Minute, brought to you by Movie Night Autopsy.